So you're a diver who decides to tackle some sketchy and unexplored underwater cave, Cova del Arc, with your three buddies. But when you get there, one of them flat out refuses to dive, and another freaks out and bails halfway. You and your best friend, though, ain't giving up. You keep pushing forward. As it turns out, Bold Move traps you in a place with nothing but darkness, horror, and no way out. Now, what's in store for you? Nitrogen narcosis, death by oxygen depletion, drowning, or some miraculous rescue. What are the odds for a diver to make it out of an unknown underwater cave alive? Diving's no joke. It demands serious prep because a mistake could cost you your life. And guess what? There are different types of underwater dives. So just because you're a pro at one doesn't mean you can jump into another without extra training, especially when it comes to cave diving. Exploring underwater tunnels is a serious challenge, even for the world's top experts. What are the chances for inexperienced divers to survive such a deadly quest? Ricard and Denisio were certified divers with underwater cave experience before, yet not like Cova del Arcs, the one they decided to conquer in July of 2014. This limestone tunnel near the Catalan town of La Estartit off the northeast coast of Spain had a tiny opening in the village at a 10 meter depth leading to an unexplored section over 86 meters long. The first half of the tunnel had a big dome-shaped chamber and was fairly well explored. However, after 45 meters, the rocky cave floor turned into a thick layer of mud, and the walls sharply narrowed. Until 2014, no one knew where this tunnel led. That mystery drew in divers, especially Ricard and Denisio, who were into cave diving. So these guys roll up to the coast with the other two buddies. They planned this adventure together for months. Unexpectedly, one diver backs out, saying someone needs to call for help if things go south. The rest of the group heads to the cave entrance, thinking the fellow just chickened out. The divers quickly check the first part of the tunnel and approach the narrowing leading to the unexplored section. As the first guy inches forward, ancient sediment starts rising from the floor, making the water murkier and increasing the danger for the divers. Indeed, even in well-lit areas, low visibility can be a serious problem. Because, you see, it's easy to lose your sense of direction and space in general. But for this trio of divers, things were about to get much worse. On top of not knowing the area, these guys forgot to attach a safety line. With that, they could have found their way out blindly. Ricard and Denisio were set on going farther, but their cautious partner protested. He didn't want to continue without a safety line and tried convincing the others to turn back. They didn't listen, and he swam back to the exit alone, leaving Denisio and Ricard confidently heading into the unknown. They had no clue that with every move forward, they were getting closer to their demise. It wasn't until about 80 meters from the entrance, where visibility dropped to zero, that the divers finally decided to turn back. Yet by then, it was too late. They found themselves in a vast chamber, and the tunnel that led them there disappeared behind a thick black wall of mud. Lit up by dim flashlights, they scanned the space around, hoping to spot an exit. Even if they did, the chances of rescue were slim, as air in their tanks was running out. Desperate, the divers just swam ahead and squeezed through an unknown tight crack. It could have hit a dead end at any moment, but suddenly, the walls parted and the guys ended up in a previously unknown underground lake with an air pocket. They popped their heads out of the water, ditched their gear, and took a deep breath. They'd just narrowly escaped death, so naturally, they were cracking jokes and laughing. At least, at first. All they could do now was wait for their fellow divers back on land to realize something went wrong and call for help. That's exactly what happened when Ricard and Denisio didn't show up on time. Yet the search and rescue operation could only kick off six hours later. The first attempt to explore the cave failed because the tunnel's far end was still heavily silted, hindering orientation. So the search had to be postponed until the next morning. Meanwhile, the air pocket that recently saved the lives of the two divers became their prison. It was roughly 30 square meters and only about one and a half meters high. Despite having breathable air, there was no ventilation. So with each exhale, Ricard and Denisio were getting more carbon dioxide and less oxygen. Signs of hypoxia showed up, extreme fatigue, dizziness, and slowed down thinking processes. Suddenly, 
Dionisio saw Rickard slowly sinking underwater. He managed to pull him up and bring him to his senses. Still, the situation was getting increasingly worse, and within a few hours, Rickard blacked out again. This time, Dionisio didn't have the strength to save his buddy. He watched him die right in front of his eyes, realizing the same fate awaited him. When the rescue operation resumed the next day, no one doubted that both divers had perished. Overnight, the silt settled, allowing the rescuers to reach the crack through which Rickard and Dionisio entered the underground lake. A diver dared to swim in and was shocked by what he saw. Rickard's lifeless body floated on the surface, and nearby, clinging to the rocks, Dionisio barely hung on to life. The guy was so disoriented that he didn't understand where he was or what was happening. He refused to let them put an oxygen mask on him, so rescuers had to gradually release oxygen to him under his nose. But when they tried to convince Dionisio to dive underwater to escape the cave, he panicked and flat out refused. It was only when one of his fellow divers swam up to him that the man recognized a familiar face. And after 24 hours, he finally made it to safety. They also managed to bring his buddy Rickard's body to the surface. So in the end, both divers made it out of the tunnel, but unfortunately, neither of them was alive. For underwater enthusiasts, this kind of risk is always there, especially when exploring the world's most dangerous caves. Just like the Italians, Carlos Basso and Carlos Barbieri did. They were well-known and experienced daredevils, but neither of them was a certified diver. Could that somehow affect their chances of getting out of the underwater cave? El Dudu? They decided to conquer this legend of the Dominican Republic in February of 2019. The entrance to El Dudu is at a depth of 20 meters in the same El Dudu Lagoon. The main cave tunnel is about 120 meters long and ends with another exit, which is quite unusual. It leads to a creepy flooded chamber with countless bat skeletons. Basso and Barbieri knew that the most ambitious divers covered the entire El Dudu path in about 45 minutes. So they hoped to handle it in roughly the same time frame, relying on their previous experience. They didn't care that they ventured into a cave without certificates or proper gear. Basso and Barbieri dove into El Dudu at around 11.45 a.m., disappearing from the view of other divers. About an hour later, they were supposed to reappear near the cave exit. As you might guess, that never happened. When the two thrill seekers still hadn't shown up by midday, their disappearance was reported to rescuers. Since El Dudu had air pockets where Basso and Barbieri could breathe, the search started as quickly as possible. In the cave, rescuers noticed dense clouds of silt, indicating where the divers might have gone. However, as the rescuers swam further, visibility worsened. Eventually, the search had to be halted. Furthermore, the situation didn't improve over the next few days, and rescuers doubted they'd ever find the missing divers. Finally, they sparted Barbieri's body in one of the narrow crevices. However, even after a week of daily efforts, retrieving it proved impossible. Basso's body was never found. Nonetheless, local cave explorers were bent sure to retrieve the remains of the deceased divers. So they sought help from two of the world's best rescue divers. Ed Sorensen and Mike Young. Unfortunately, they faced problems at the Dominican Republic border. You see, the government didn't want to risk the lives of two Americans. Eventually, they were allowed entry, but with one condition. They had only eight days to retrieve both bodies from the cave, whether they succeeded or not. After this period, the operation was decided to be permanently halted. Due to the continuous attempts by local rescuers to retrieve the bodies, the water in the cave was extremely murky. So Sorensen had to hold on to the safety line with one hand and basically feel his way through to find Carlos Barbieri's body. To extract him from a narrow passage, Sorensen and Young asked to have milk cartons filled with weights and brought into the cave. They gradually attached this cargo to Barbieri's body to dislodge it. Only after four hours, they finally succeeded. They brought Carlos Barbieri's body to the surface, and later Sorensen and Young found Basso's body at the very end of the cave. The death of the two divers was a terribly tragic event. Still, rescuers found solace in being able to take their bodies out of that underwater tomb. So Basso and Barbieri finally made it out, but dead. Experienced divers know that it's easy to stay underwater forever, and particularly at the peak popularity of cave diving, such risks were way too high.
Back in 1973, nine buddies gearing up for a thrill in the shaft didn't give it a second thought. Even though back then, there wasn't an exact map for this legendary freshwater cave. Ironically, the unknown is what drew divers in. The entrance to the shaft is near Mount Gambier in South Australia, looking like a tiny hole in the middle of nowhere. However, seven meters below the surface lies an underground lake. Actually, it's just the entrance to a gigantic cone-shaped cave with a stone mound in the center. Its peak is at a depth of 36 meters, and the base is at 50, but that's not all. Tunnels branch out on both sides of the mound. Currently, it's known that the northern one descends to a depth of 80 meters, and the eastern one goes down to a whopping 124. Either way, in 1973, these depths were practically unreachable because knowledge about cave diving and technology was lacking. However, on May 27th, nine divers got permits to plunge into the cave and camped by its entrance. One of the group members, Robert Smith, had already dived the shaft eight times, so he took charge of planning. That day, divers laid a safety line and briefly scoped out the beginning of the cave. The next morning, though right before the eagerly awaited dive, one of the participants suddenly backed out. So, eight divers descended into the shaft, filling their tanks with compressed air. That meant they weren't planning to go below the base of the stone mound at a depth of 50 meters. For deeper dives, a special gas mix is used, and the divers knew that well. Even at this depth, breathing air was risky due to the likelihood of nitrogen narcosis. It's a dangerous condition where consciousness clouds, panic or euphoria can occur, and a person literally loses control. So when Robert Smith found himself at a depth of 55 meters, he felt symptoms of nitrogen narcosis. Reluctantly, he signaled the rest of the group that he was heading to the surface. Around the same time, Glenn Millett, whose brother and sister were also in the cave, along with two other divers, floated up. They had almost no air left in their tanks, and consequently, it was about to run out for the others still underwater. The four buddies decided to wait for the rest on the surface, but minutes passed and no one showed up. So, Glenn put on a spare tank and swam to look for his relatives. Descending deeper in total darkness, he couldn't see any signs of people. Only at the risky mark of 69 meters did he notice a flashlight. However, his hope turned to despair in an instant because, at the bottom, there was only his brother Stephen's equipment. Stephen himself was nowhere to be found. Moreover, the water around was so murky that visibility dropped almost to zero. Panic struck Glenn when he realized his air was running out. If he wanted to survive, he had to resurface immediately. When he returned, an ambulance was already waiting by the shaft entrance, but there was no one to help. Still holding on to hope, Peter Burr surveyed the cave once more and still didn't find anything. Right then, the surviving divers realized that their four buddies probably had lost their lives. Local rescuers began the search operation the next day. Robert Smith joined them still unable to believe anyone from their group could dare swim into the side tunnels. Yet all signs pointed to that, as in the main chamber, no bodies could be found. Rescuers lacked deep diving skills, so exploring the side tunnels was beyond their ability. Hence, they embarked on an extensive training with military divers while the rest had to wait. In January of the next year, landowners allowed a film crew into the shaft. They were working on a documentary about diving. When they lowered a powerful light into the cave and turned it on, the beam revealed a body in a wetsuit. The police retrieved the remains, identified as Stephen Millett later on. The cave underwent another thorough search, yet no other bodies were found among the deceased divers. Things took a turn during the next attempt when, in the spring, rescuers returned from training. At a depth of 56 meters in one of the side tunnels, they discovered two bodies side by side, Kristen Millett and Gordon Roberts. It seemed like, facing death, they hugged each other to avoid being alone. In the same tunnel, but at 66 meters, they noticed the body of the last victim, John Bokerman. Despite all efforts, divers couldn't go deeper. The deceased diver might have remained in the darkness of the shaft forever. However, rescuers didn't give up. And finally, after additional training, 11 months and 11 days after the tragedy, they successfully brought John Bokerman's body to the surface. So, despite all divers in this group being experienced and certified, half of them perished in the underwater cave and barely escaped staying there forever. The unpleasant truth was that during that tragic dive, they broke numerous rules. The group laid only one safety line for eight people, 
didn't prepare extra oxygen tanks and dove to a seemingly dangerous depth with compressed air. Do divers really lose their lives solely due to their own mistakes? What are the chances of getting out of an underwater cave if you're a pro following all the rules? This is what Eric Estable did, a spelunker with 25 years of experience. He was aware of the dangers awaiting him in underwater tunnels, so he always approached dives responsibly, especially when he started exploring the Dragonier God Cave in France. It's a narrow tunnel, originating from the source of the river, descending to a depth of 87 meters below sea level, and its length exceeds 1,040 meters. Inside Dragonier God, there are air pockets, yet most have dangerously low oxygen levels, making them unsafe to breathe. The narrow cave tunnels are covered with a thick layer of mud, and visibility and water drops practically to zero. Eric Estable wanted to create an accurate map of the cave, and once again dove into it. On October 3rd in 2010, he brought two breathing apparatuses, two scooters, and five air balloons, and informed other spelunkers about his plans. He was prepared to spend about six hours underwater, exploring the deepest parts of the cave. But after that time passed, hour after hour floated by, and Eric still didn't return. The next morning, local rescuers panicked. Still, they were almost certain that the world-renowned spelunker found one of the air pockets and was waiting for help. Yet, due to the low air quality in such places, he had no more than a day's worth of supply, and experts capable of finding him in Dragonier God in France were nowhere to be found. So, they urgently called in some of the world's best spelunker rescuers from Great Britain, Rick Stanton and John Volanthan. They arrived at Dragonier God on October 5th and immediately descended into the cave. Unfortunately, they faced a terrible water murk, which was odd, as it all should have settled by now. And only at a distance of 780 meters from the cave entrance, they realized what happened. A massive pile of rocks blocked the tunnel. Most believed Eric had managed to survive, while Stanton and Volanthan tried to find a way through the blockage, they heard a strange knocking from the other side. And only after eight days, clearing a narrow passage through the rocks and removing almost all their equipment, rescuers managed to swim into the blocked part of the cave. And just a few meters in, they spotted Eric Estable. He was dead. Despite all rescuers' hopes, the spelunker hadn't found an air pocket in the unknown part of the tunnels. Moreover, all attempts to retrieve his body from the treacherous cave failed. Despite the superhuman efforts of the world's best rescuers, on January 8th in 2011, the recovery operation was halted. So the legendary spelunker, who always followed all the rules, couldn't make it out of the deadly underwater tunnel and was left there forever. It seems like the only way to see underwater caves without risking your life is to watch a video about them. Would you choose such an extreme hobby for yourself?